going to be speaking on one mind or communicating like Christ in your marriage. There's going to be three basic points to this class time. One, briefly defining biblical communication. Two, we're looking at how the gospel changes our communication in Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 32. And then three, some practical applications and homework for you. So, communication is extremely important. I hate you. I hate you. You don't really care. Well, what do you have to complain about today? You shouldn't feel that way. Well, you know what? Miracles still happen. You're ready on time. You always forget what I asked you to do. We ought to have company more often. It's the only time we get good food around here. How come you get home early tonight when you don't do it other nights? Or let's consider some alternatives to those statements. This is, you can see that this is supposed to be an attention getter. You guys' eyes picked up with, I hate you. <laughs> I love you more than life itself. I really need you. It, says, it sounds as though you had a difficult day. Is there any way I can help you? I'm sorry that you feel that way. How can I help? I'll be glad to pray for you and do anything I can. Honey, I just wanted you to know that I, I really appreciate the way you hurried to be ready to go on time. I love the way you smile. It brightens my day. You are a delight to all my senses. I can't wait to, to kiss you when I come home. I can't wait to feel your arms around me as we hug. I can't wait to be home to be with you. I want to spend time with you more than anyone else. That was a super meal. You're a fantastic cook. <laughs> and boy, it's really great you got home early. I really miss you during the day. So isn't that second set of quotes so much better? Well, how you communicate is very important. Let's think about what communication is. Let's define communication, okay? It is when two parties are involved in clearly sending humbly receiving and correctly understanding the right message. When two parties are involved in clearly sending, humbly receiving, and correctly understanding the right message. It's not just verbal. It can come uh, with your volume. It can come with your tone. Or it can come with your tongue. It comes with your facial expressions, or it comes with your facial expressions. It comes with hand gestures. It comes with sighing, or sighing. It comes with body posture. When you lay back as if you're listening and your, your head's nodding, or you lean forward on the table. Maybe your hands folded, showing by your posture you're intently listening. So communication has a lot more to do than just verbal. It's body language, how you speak, your tone. There's also different levels to communication. The, hey, what's up? Cliche, the weather. Like, I heard somebody say once, talking about the weather is like... Um, conversational grease. 
You know, it's, you, don't know, you don't know what to talk about anything else, so you just talk about the weather. You're like, oh, because it's something everybody has in common. So you're like, oh, how about that rain? It's cold outside, isn't it? You know, you do that with a stranger. It's just a cliche, casual sort of level of communication. And then there's a, another level that's more informational. How was your day? What, what happened today? And then there's a more emotional level. Well, how did you feel about what happened today? Did it bother you? You're understanding how the person felt. You see, you usually don't go to that level with somebody like a coworker or a, a stranger. And then there's another level where you're talking about your relationship with the Lord. So cliche, casual, then emotional level, and then something deep about your relationship with the Lord. Why you do what you do. So let's look at Amos 3.3. 3. In the book of Amos, in chapter 3, the prophet's beginning to speak about the, the judgment of God that's coming. And he says, hear this word from the Lord, chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So he's going to, he, the prophet's beginning to explain the wrath and the judgment that's going to come. And he's going to say a number of proverbial phrases that everybody knows are true. And starting in verse 3. Can two walk together unless they're agreed? Obviously no. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Obviously no. Will a, will a young lion cry out in his den if he has caught nothing? Obviously, no. Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there's no trap for it? Obviously not. Will a snare spring up from the earth, this trap spring up from the earth, if it's caught nothing at all? No, traps don't spring by themselves. If a trumpet's blown in the city, will not the people be afraid? Oh, of course they'll be afraid. If, if there's calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? You see, it's building up all these obvious, 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 obvious statements to say, well, when judgment comes, it comes from the Lord. Well, my point here is one of the obvious statements that is, can two walk together unless they agree? So let it be an obvious statement to you that can two walk together in a marriage unless they agree? And how can they agree unless they communicate well together? You must communicate well together. There's a some markers of bad communication. When you have not been communicating well, listen to these. They, they were revealing to me. When issues remain unclarified between you, you're not communicating well. When wrong ideas are uncorrected, communication is part of the, your problem. When conflicts and misunderstandings are unresolved, communication's an issue. Confusion and disorder occur. When wise decision making is thwarted, communication is a, is a problem. When the development of your deep unity and relational intimacy is hindered, communication is a problem. Boredom, Discontentment, frustration develop in your relationship. Communication is part of the issue. Interpersonal problems pile up and barriers become higher between the two of you. Communication is your problem. Temptation to look for someone else to tell about your day, to communicate with, to talk to. Communication is part of your problem. When you don't really get to know each other, 
and you grow distant from one another. Communication is part of your problem. When you don't receive spiritual help from one another, you're not communicating the way God has planned you to. This is kind of like the symptoms when I say, okay, if you got this, the spots, have you got the itchy, itchy around the back of the neck? Have you got the cough, the scratchy throat? I'm diagnosing the problem. So do you have some of these issues? Or when you have some of these issues, then no, communication is a great part of your problem. So as you listen today about this, this teaching about communication, know that there's going to be different ways uh, people have trouble with this. A lot of guys, they don't want to communicate. They're lazy about it. Are you lazy about your communication? A lot of ladies uh, are emotional about it. They maybe will say things they shouldn't. Or maybe the guy will say some things he shouldn't. And your communication, the way you communicate is a problem. So if you're sitting back thinking uh, you're apathetic to this, times to wake up and see the effect that it will have on your marriage if men, if you don't actively lead in this, actively lead and communicate, leading the communication time with your wife. And ladies, do you humbly submit with the right attitude to that time? Okay, so there's the introduction and the defining of communication. Let's look at Ephesians 4. And we're going to see how the gospel changes our communication. This is the, the heart of the lesson. In Ephesians, we want to remember the, the overflow of the book. We want to remember the, the argument of the book, and it lends weight is what gives you the heart to communicate like Christ. I don't want to come and teach you some moral lessons that the Bible says without teaching you the reason why you have these morals. Otherwise, a Muslim could come and teach you about communication. A Mormon could come and teach you about communication. What's the difference between this lecture about communication and some other false religion. It's the gospel. The gospel makes it so that you want to communicate and you want to communicate the way that Christ wants you to. So remember with me the flow of the book of Ephesians and it will create the desire in every redeemed heart to want to communicate the way Christ commands us to. In chapter 1, we see the purpose for which God made the world. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We see the Father at work, the Son at work, and the Spirit at work calling before the foundation of the, of the world, calling who would be saved, and that you could be included in that, that selection, in that remnant of grace, is an amazing thing. I remember a guy was talking about the lottery yesterday. And as a Christian, you think you've already won more, so much more than the lottery. To be in the redeemed, what grace upon grace. And that God is at work before time. And that you get, you, little you get to be included in that great story. And chapter 1 goes on in verses 15 to 23 to explain about how, what hope, what inheritance, what power we get to be included in, in the blessing of salvation. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, remember, not only is this an eternal work that God has in mind, but he has you in mind who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Think about how majestic and sovereign he is and then yet how wicked you have been that he would include you in this salvation. 
that you, while you were dead, your trespasses and sins, he made you alive. And you remember the, the grace and the faith that he gave you. And how that was not of yourself, but it was a gift of God. And then chapter 2 recalls you to remember in verses 11 to 22 about how God has made us together one people, whether Jew or Gentile, that together we're made one people of God in the church. And how there you used to be a stranger to the covenants. You were not, most of us were not Jewish. We're not part of all the promises that God gets to, to give to his people. But he grafts you in, into his tree. What a blessing. The, and this is how he forms the church. And you get to be part of it. And then chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, Paul says, And this mystery, this amazing gospel, I get to preach. And this amazing gospel, you get to preach. You who are the least among the saints, you get to preach the marvelous, amazing mystery of Christ. And in chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, Paul has a prayer that you would understand, that people would understand what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ. What a beautiful, amazing gospel we get to be involved in. This should change your heart to want to communicate well in the way Christ communicates. In chapters 4, he begins to open up about how we're to apply this. In verses 1 to 6, unity in the church. In verses 7 to 16, about how we've been gifted for the purpose of serving one another. And then in verses 17 to 24, he explains about how we are to put off the old man and put on the new. You see in verses 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all in clean, cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we're to put off the old man and put on the new man because of the grace of God in our lives, because of the wonderful salvation and how you were dead in sins and made alive, you should be motivated to continue to go on repenting, to go on growing in the Lord. So what are those practical things? Well, in great part, this next text has a lot about communication. Let's read it together. Verses 25 to 32. Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. They may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if you look in your conference folder, I have a, a little... Blocks set up there of put off, put on, and why. 
Let's look at these and think about the application in your marriage. There's certainly, this, these principles are to be given with anybody, to be applied anywhere for the Christian. But then how much more should they be applied in your home with your wife or with your husband? So verse 25, the first in the list of five things were to put off. And then it, each one of these has put off, put on, and tells us why. Verse 25, therefore putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. How important is it to tell the truth to your spouse. A lot of husbands and wives are deceitful in one another and hurtful to one another. Sometimes the wife will go out and, the husband, and she'll come back and the husband will have spent the whole time on entertainment and then she asks him, what did you do? And he spent five minutes fixing something, and he spent two hours watching the movie, or whatever, and, she, and he'll say, well, I, I fixed this. What is that but a lie? When your relationship has deceit as part of it, what I mean by half-truths, exaggerations, manipulation, that you exaggerate something in such a way so as to get her to do what you want her to do. That's lying and manipulation. And the text says, it takes us to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16. This is a quote. For time's sake, we won't go there. But it's a quote from Zechariah. And it's the saying, he's speaking about when he calls the, his people, when God calls the people of Israel back to, back to him, that this will be their heart, this will be their desire, that they would speak truth with his neighbor. Well, how much so should it be with you? If you have tasted the grace of God, if you have known the salvation that's in Christ, how much more should you speak truth with your wife, with your husband? And the reason why he gives is because we're members of one another. He's already given the picture of a body, when you lie or deceive your spouse, you are hurting and attacking yourself. You don't see it that way. You think of it as, I'm achieving something good for the, the relationship. You know, what, what's the example that every lost person gives about why they can lie? Well, if my wife comes out and she says, do I look fat in this? Man, I I'm, can't tell her the truth. And so therefore, it's okay if I lie. Haven't you heard that when you evangelize somebody? <laughs> there is a, a graciousness to speech that makes it so that you can say the truth in a right way. Like my wife tells me all the time I look um, bad in what I wear. And she helps me. <laughs> and I'm glad for it. And I need the help. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say my wife dresses me. <laughs> Some of you remember what I looked like before I was married, so you're glad she does. <laughs> but the point is that deceitfulness will hurt yourself because you are members with one another so mu even more in marriage, let alone if you lie to somebody in the church, you're members with the person in the church. But all the more with your marriage. Don't think that you can deceive with your communication and that your relationship will not be hurt, will not be destroyed from the foundation level. The next point of communication is, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, is verse 26, to be angry and do not sin. So here this is from Psalm 4.4, 4, this quote, and he's saying what to put off is the idea of anger with, marked with sin. We know that anger can, can be without sin. 
And here's another in a series of imperatives. There's, there's like about 10 imperatives, I think, in this passage. So he's commanding you that when anger comes, it must not be with sin. So if we're to put off a sinful anger, we're to put on the anger that does not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, the anger, you can know if your anger is righteous or sinful in part by how long does it remain with you. Are you going to bed and waking up angry? That's unrighteous. How much should this be applied in your marriage? Replace that sinful anger with it knowing the, the necessity to deal with it. And what happens? What's the why? If verse 26 is not let the, your, the sun go down your wrath, the why is because it will give opportunity to the devil. The devil likes disunity among believers, and he likes it among the marriages in a church. And he knows the way to achieve that is to let them have a bitterness and an anger against one another. And then when the opportunity to sin more comes up, you'll take it and you'll take it and you'll take it. And the anger will fuel more and more sin. This is the, the crack in the door where he wants to destroy your marriage. Do not give him opportunity. Do not give him place. Deal with your anger. In verse 28, he begins to explain, let him who stole steal no longer. That's what you're to put off. What are you to put on but laboring and working with your hands that you may be given something who has, he, to him who has need. This happens even in marriages where often in marriages the finances are separate. And why? Because one of the spouses is, is stealing from the other. The, the finances that are to be together and join together, one spouse may be, have been abused so much by the stealing and the buying that someone else does without control that they have to have separate finances in order to have what, in order to have what they necessarily need as a family. Instead, you're to labor, working with your hands. That the purpose is that you may ha have something to give who ha him who has need. Now, it says to, that you may give to something, to, to give to him who, not, who has the greed, right? We know that. That it's not about whatever you want or your rights to have this possession or your rights to have that possession. But instead, it's about working hard so that you could bless somebody else. And how beautiful is this when a couple does this together? Giving to people who have need. So back to communication in verse 29. Put off corrupt words proceeding out of your mouth. And instead, speak what is good for necessary edification. The corrupt words here is used of words that are rotten, spoiled. The other times this word is used in the New Testament for corrupt is with fruit or with fish that is spoiled and rotten. Some of you don't like the smell of new fish, let alone old fish. Well, that's the kind of words that come out of your mouth that God is commanding you that those corrupt words, they can be in that, that vicious tone or they can be in that vicious gesture or the volume. But instead, you're to speak what is good and necessary, what's building up for your spouse. Like some of those examples, right, from the beginning? About the meal. Well, what about the guests coming over? That's the only time I get a good meal. Instead of complimenting, building up your wife. So you're to have the idea, I want to communicate with her in such a way, I want to communicate with him 
that builds him up in the faith, that encourages him. And what's the reason why God gives you? So that you would impart grace, so it would not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is grieved to see you argue. The Holy Spirit is grieved to see you when you take those words out of anger and you have a sarcastic point to them. And you say, oh, if I say this in such a way, that will sting. And when you let the word fly and you're like, you see the hurt on their face, they're like, yeah. You're like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. Have you felt that? Have you experienced that? When was the last time you experienced that? Maybe a better question. Where you gave a corrupt word for the purpose of hurt, the purpose of tearing down that person. The Holy Spirit is grieved with that. The Holy Spirit who seals you, who seals you for the future day of redemption. The Holy Spirit, the one who is in you, who is the sealing, is the sign and the mark of the, the final judgment day. That you'll be with God. That one who has done that to, for you, his partaking in your salvation, the one who has saved you is grieved when you try and hurt your spouse with your words. So finally, the fifth point of what, how communication is to be changed from the gospel is we're to put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Be put away from you with all malice. There's these six phrases of bitterness, your fixed attitude of sharpness and harshness, the wrath, your temporary outbursts, the anger, the slow burning of indignation, the clamor, the loud yelling and quarreling. I remember one couple, they, uh, their neighbors would be able to hear them yell, and they were professing Christians in the, in the arguments. Think about it, if the, they would go over and speak to their next door neighbor about the gospel, and then they hear them yelling over the fence. The clamor, the slander, the speaking evil of a person, like name calling, belittling, the malice is this speech designed to hinder or cause someone to suffer. It's just an overall evil idea. It's a summary term to say all this, all this bitterness, all this wrath, all this anger, clamor or yelling, evil speaking, it's, it's evil. It's malice. Instead, we're to replace it. What's the opposite that we're to replace it with? But with a kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. You see the motivation? You remember the parable from Matthew 18? With a man who was forgiven the unforgivable debt. And how he went out and he couldn't forgive his fellow worker. With a, with a much smaller debt? Would you go out and do the same thing? Or should you not be tender-hearted, forgiving this opposite idea where you are willing to let it go? You're willing to give up your revenge, give up your grudge, be compassionate, be easy to live with, good and helpful to the other. And why? Because of the gospel. Because of the gospel. You're to apply this heart of communication because of how Christ loves you. Look at chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, cornerstone, in your communication, be an imitator of God as dear children and walk in love. Don't just give a few statements about it. Walk in it. Live it. Walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us. Are you willing to give yourself to your spouse in communication, in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma? Look at how much it cost Christ to be offered as a sacrifice to God. 
Shouldn't you be willing to pay the price of your pride to communicate well with your spouse? Okay, so let's think about now some practical applications from this. You have, you've heard us think about the definition of communication. You've seen what the Bible has to say about communication. Now, let's think about the practical application of that. The way I was trying to think of a memory hook for myself to remember this. So, okay, you've got to bring the right heart. You got to how to bring your body, the, and you got to bring the right the time, okay, for these practical applications. The right heart. If I'm going to bring the right heart with my spouse, that means I got to be have the gospel on my mind, humble, driven to the Lord in dependence upon Him. It means when I'm reading the Bible, I am saying, what do I need to learn? How do I need to be corrected, Lord? Guide me. I need to know you. I need to obey you. I need to serve you. And I can't do this. When you pray, you glorify God, worshiping him and desperately dependent upon him. This gives you the heart. When you're listening to sermons and teachings and lectures and small group and Sunday school. And you're saying, yes, I want to obey that. Yes, I want to live that. The continual humble heart because of the gospel. If you bring the right heart, you could come home and... You, the kids could have, you know, the, those diapers that explode, you know, where the, it runs out down the leg. You know, yeah, all the parents are like, yes. <laughs> the blowout, that's what it's called, the blowout. <laughs> and there's twins with blowouts, and you have been exhausted. But if you've been thinking about the gospel on the way home and you're exhausted, drive, then you're ready to serve the way Christ served. You see how it changes the heart? You're ready to communicate? It's the only way that communication is possible. When you have a humble desire because of the gospel to please God. And you're willing to admit your sin in the matter. That's what happens in the gospel. You're willing to admit your sin in the matter. If you're willing to communicate that way, willing to admit your sin in whatever matter it is, that's the right heart. So the right heart, now the right bring your whole body into it practically when you go to communicate you got to be open and honest you got to control your temper you can't retreat into silence you can't use manipulative tears you can't use harsh words you can't be condoning sin and just saying oh it's not going to matter it will matter. It comes back. You can't be willing to condone your own sin. Most people are willing to, uh, to condone their own sin and say, oh, I won't condone my spouse's sin. But we be, will be willing and submissive to say, my sin matters. Listen to your spouse. They're going to be able to reveal your sin like nobody else. And you need it. Be a good listener. This is so important to communication, especially guys. you got to wake up and listen. Be an active listener. Try and say back to your wife what she just said to you in other words. Okay? That keeps you engaged because you're like, i got to give the, the summary statement of what she just said. She just may talk for like 10 minutes straight and you got to summarize it. <laughs> right? So you got to keep track. Okay, what did she talk about? What are the multiple points? Keep track of it. So you say, so what you're saying is, da 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 and you can say what she said in 10 seconds. That's it. <laughs> and she'll respond back, yes, that's what I mean. you got to be an active listener. If you are not a good listener, that's, for most people, that's the hard part of communication. They can talk and say what they thought and what they felt, but then when it comes to the other person, they're thinking about what they said. Did I say that right? And, and they hear, wah, 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 like Charlie Brown. What? <laughs> Are you going to be an active listener? you got to work hard at it. This is hard work to be an active listener. Understand their point of view. Give them your undivided attention. 
don't be interrupting. Try and understand it from their perspective. When you listen and when you repeat back what they say, try and understand how they feel, how they think, and put yourself in their shoes. If this is the regular practice of your day, the regular practice of your life, then when it comes to the time of the arguments, then you'll be able to be better at conflict resolution. If you're regularly communicating in a good way. Okay, when you come with the right body, with the right attitude, with the right heart, practically you're going to be avoiding emotionally charged words. You're going to stop having reruns about your old arguments. You'll deal with one problem at a time. You'll deal with the present, not the past. You'll be responsible for your own emotions, words, actions, and reactions. You'll major on the positive. You'll learn the importance of nonverbal communication. You'll express your thoughts and concerns to one another. You'll practice the golden rule. You'll have, you'll hope for nothing in return. That's a gospel attitude. When you hope for nothing in return. Okay, so if you bring the right heart, you have bring your body, what about the time to close? The, the time. A practical suggestion would be spending the small amount of time each day communicating about your day, about how you felt about it, communicating about the Word of God with them in a short time, and then once a week you have those more sustained times where, where you have the date night, where you're able to speak to your spouse for an extended period of time about an important issue. And you have a number of worksheets in the, the folder, and those are meant for those extended period of times where you can practically do that homework. Um, my wife and I were doing one of those where we would list out our top three interests, desires, dislikes, likes, and you try and write down what hers would be, and then you write down your own, and then you match up and see if you pass the test, how well you know your wife, how well you're communicating. And you think, well, I won't learn anything new. I've been married to her for so many years. And then one of the categories surprises you. Like, oh, wow, I failed in that category. I completely missed. And so I'm trying to give you some practical things that you can do on a date night to communicate together. So in order to communicate, hear the summary of the matter. You got to understand rightly how important it is and define it rightly. It's not just your words, it's your many things about your life. In order to communicate rightly, two, you got have to have the gospel driven heart to communicate. And finally, you got to make it practical. You got to employ it. You have to make the time. If you don't make the time, then you will fall into bad communication. You'll communicate one way or another. You'll communicate by not making the time. You don't want to say that to your spouse, that it's, you're not important enough for me to make this time to communicate carefully and biblically with you. It has an immense impact on your unity. Wayne Mack is a counselor, and he says this is the greatest problem he faces in marriage, is that, that couples don't communicate. Be motivated and put in the work to communicate the way Christ wants you to. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for helping us to understand how better how communication should take place in our marriages. We want them to be pleasing to you. We don't want our communication to grieve you, Holy Spirit. Please help us to put in the effort and the time to mark this out in our daily week and days that we would communicate lovingly, compassionately with our spouses. Thank you, Lord, for communicating to us with the gospel. And help us, Lord, to not, never forget and be motivated by your goodness and grace to us. Amen.